In 1995, my then-husband and I set out to document the life of his father, the late jazz guitarist Grant Green. At the time, we knew very little about how to make a film. Along the way, we made some missteps, and although we are no longer together, we still think it's a story worth sharing. Here's our journey. Back over at that the red band with my best friend in the whole world, his name was uh, Herbie Steele. And at this house right here was another one of my good friends that was Rod. Uh, at this house right here, which is a pretty interesting house, this was uh, Stevie Wonder's parents' house. Stevie Wonder used to frequent here a lot. And walking down in this direction, 18066, this is where we used to live, right over here. You know my dad's Grant Green, and uh, he had an album called Grant Stand Green Street. Green is beautiful, and it's funny because back in 1972 he had a green Cadillac outside convertible, so it's all funny. Over here, this 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 used to be the uh, living room over here. And that's where my dad used to hang out with you know some of the guys he was bringing into the band, and they were talking over different songs and stuff like that. Like my brother Greg, he used to always stay back here in his room back over here. This is kind of like his world. We can never come back here. If we come back here, Greg would just kill us and beat us up, so we can never go back here. My dad spent most of his time in the kitchen because he ate a lot, and he's always here eating. You know, uh, I mean, huge breakfasts, lunch, dinner. He was always back here eating. And back through here, I'm quite sure you guys have heard of the uh, NBA, but we have the uh, GBA, which is the Green Lawn Basketball Association. And 
We used to have some hell of games back here. I remember those times my father used to always tell us, just don't tear up my goddamn garage because the best part holes do right on top of the garage where those holes are. I think we put those holes there. We used to have this dog named Satan. Uh, and of course, we all know Satan means the devil. She was a German shepherd. It was my father's dog. That's what he said. He got as a puppy, but he could never handle her. But she was always down here in the basement, and uh, no one could handle the dog, only me. My, my father used to always want to just, like, you know, just put, put the dog to sleep because the dog used to bite mailmen, gas men. Anybody came in the neighborhood, she would bite. She even gave one of my best friends 21 stitches right up his uh, left leg. Up here. <laughs> this is funny, you know, right here. I remember once uh, me and my dad was playing on the top of the stairs, and, you know, he was pretty uh, active. And one day he was chasing me down the stairs, and he fell, and he fell down the stairs. And it was kind of funny because we were all here, all the Greg and John was here. And when he fell down the stairs, he ended up down the stairs upside down. And the first thing he did, he grabbed his hand and said, oh, God, I hope I didn't hurt my damn picking fingers. And we thought it was hilarious because he was upside down. And my father was a pretty big guy. When did your dad sleep? Oh, he slept uh, on the top right there. He used to always call out the window when I asked him to come in the house. He used to call out, Junior, real loud. And I used to kind of hate him calling me Junior, you know, because it kind of felt like I was kind of soft, you know, being Junior. It was once said that an image can take on new meaning years later. I had not yet lost my own father when we first started working on this film. My father died in 2012. Like Grant's dad, he had checked himself out of the hospital and eventually suffered a fatal heart attack. But there's more. So much had happened in America since the footage was initially shot. While some people would rather just hear about Grant the father and his music, it became apparent that wasn't the whole story. There was Grant the father and Grant the son his son, via these interviews, had opened up. Men don't usually talk. This one was. Looking back, we should be glad. The body that's most under surveillance is talking and not doing something else. People tell me now, that, uh, did you know that Earl Klug used to come by the house? I'm like, nah, I didn't know. I don't know who the hell Earl Klug was, but I know who uh, Earth, Earth, Wind and Fire was, though. Detroit, we moved to Detroit in 1971, and then we did Divisions album after that. And, you know, we played a lot of Watts, Mozambique. The biggest people uh, uh, wanted Grant to come in there. You know, well, this is home. These what was home. Right. He says, well, Grant, you guys, uh, you guys play down Watts all the time. You know, you, uh, 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 you like local yokels. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. He says, you should go to New York and stay uh, a couple of weeks and then come back. When he moved, I told him, I said, you know, uh, you got to stay home now because people get to see you. If they see you downtown or at other clubs, they probably say, well, I'm not going to see Grant. I just saw him yesterday. You know? This cat was mingling with the customers, mingling with the people, and everybody was right at home. If a cat could come in and play, you were perfectly welcome. Hey, exactly. what are you doing standing there with your horn in the case? And a couple of my college buddies, actually, we were just out of high school, about 16 and 17, and we were tall enough to get into the club. Mm -hmm. So we got here before the cover charge, you know, because right. we didn't have any money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we were, we sat here till time to close. We were mesmerized. I think it's generally recognized in the jazz scene that more uh, jazz musicians and artists came out of Detroit than literally anywhere else. Matter of fact, so many of them have been in New York or on the West Coast so long right. that, that people don't remember that they're Detroiters until they come home. We had... Uh, all of the great Jones brothers, uh, one of the great vibes of all times uh, uh, was around here at the time. Yeah, Milt Jackson. Milt Jackson, his picture is on the wall here. Did he live close to the area? No. Nope. Uh, I think Milt lived on, uh, with his family on the east side. I got you. But he was uh, playing at the uh, Greystone Ballroom on Woodward, the old Greystone Ballroom, mm -hmm. when Diz came through one night and heard him and said, this is it. And he was one of the great creators, and, and so was Grant. And so what happened when you, when, you, when you got to New York and you guys got here? 
Well, when he got to New York, uh, he played around a couple of places, you know, like like me. And I introduced him to Alpha Line and Blue Note Records. Uh, initially, when I was got into producing records um, and got to be friends with a lot of guys that were on the Blue Note sessions from the 60s, the, the conversation would always turn to stuff that they had recorded that never came out. You know, gee, I wonder what ever happened to yada, yada, yada. Right. And I, for, I was always a big Blue Note fan, so I started to uh, make a little notebook mm -hmm. uh, of, of a guy's reminiscences of, of sessions that they thought it, were known to exist. Right. And so finally, I met Charlie Laurie at Blue Note, and he got me into the vaults, and it was, uh, it was an amazing gold mine. Uh, what I found in there. I'm talking about stuff that had never seen the light of day. Mm -hmm. And actually, the um, there were a few surprises in there, stuff that I didn't know at all existed. And one of the biggest surprises was um, a, a lot of Grant Green's recordings. Um, in particular, um, a couple of sessions with McCoy Tyner and a couple of sessions uh, a couple of years earlier with uh, Sonny Clark, about four sessions with Sonny Clark um, that were just absolutely incredible music the, the reason that stuff didn't get out i mean grant was recording in a lot of directions but really what was the most successful for him at that time was the the organ trios larry young used to talk a lot about him and well so did a lot of the guys you know i mean he, he was uh, such a major influence i remember george benson always talking and uh, larry Coriel when he first came to new york the first he came from Seattle, and the first uh, day he arrived in New York, he went to Harlem to see uh, the the trio that Grant Green and, and uh, Larry Young and Elvin Jones had. And he right. said it was just about uh, uh, what what a, a major influence he was on him. And Les Spann was here, uh, Wes Montgomery, mm -hmm. Kenny Burrell, yeah. Bill Jennings, uh, George Benson, of course, yeah. a little younger. Was there any like fierce? Competition between those guys, or did they look up to each other? Not really. Different styles. Not really. Style? No, it wasn't, wasn't fierce competition. They used to meet and uh, have sessions and play. Yeah. All the guys seemed to be kind of compatible. I was always ashamed to let Wes know that my favorite guitar player was uh, Grant Green, mm -hmm. because Grant was not considered at that time to be uh, a major guitar player. Right. They liked him, but they didn't think he was in the category of all of the. The, you know, the super fast guys, you know, who played with, you know, uh, with a lot of vigor and, you know, he played a lot of things, you know, lines over and over again. And we used to think that was, there was something wrong with that until you hung around and heard the band and heard them play. Then that didn't bother you anymore. You hear B.B. King play, he might play the same lick in the song five times, yeah. in the same song. We never thought of anything strange about that. Uh, but in jazz, it was kind of strange to hear that. I see the lists, and, and Lou Donaldson and Grant Green are probably the most uh, popular of the artists that are being sampled. And why is that? Um, there's a lot of young guys that are just discovering the sounds from these records. I don't know if they're finding them in their father's closet or, mm -hmm. or where, where they're finding them, but um, they love uh, Idris Muhammad's beat. Yeah, and they, they do and, love him. Yeah, and uh, they love a lot of the, the uh, funk licks and a lot of the horn licks. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it just caught on where a lot of DJs, and ironically, I think for the most part, started in London, and it just became a craze, and it spread over to New York and to Tokyo, and um, then a lot of the uh, rap artists started to listen to what was getting played in clubs. Stuff the kids are pulling from right now, the early 70s, the real funky stuff. I think I was a pretty hard time for my dad because I guess he was pretty much lost because this disco thing was in Donna Summers was, was happening and everybody was doing a little disco dance bullshit and I guess, you know, those guys were lost because, you know, the uh, 60s was over so there was a more aggressive jazz and they had to find something to do so, you know, my dad started playing some James Brown stuff and, you know, stuff like that and it was real funky and, and it's funny because that's what the you know the young kids like now that real funky playing you know. Sound was magic. You know? 
I had never heard a guitar like that before. You know, I grew up with Motown and Temptations and the Four Tops and Supremes. You did like a kind of like a Motown kind of thing, like right? Uh, like the Marvin. You just did some work with Marvin Gaye. I know yeah, that. I did. Uh, did I did. I worked on the road with Marvin. As I can say, stopping with Marvin on the road for many, many years. <laughs> Stop with Marvin, huh? But it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Mm -hmm. There was a, a person, you know, that was really into something. Well, we had a band, the road band was composed of like cats. Most of the guys were from the city here, had a few cats out of DC. But the guys from here, the horn section from here, were all cats really, you know, up, up top echelon, mm -hmm. as we call the, the so-called jazz mode but we could play some of everything. It can be called jazz, it can be called the ballad love, whatever you did. But that's gotta come from here, here. But this here instrumental band was like, that was awesome. Did the uh, guitar sound like, how it sound like, like Motown songs or did it sound Couldn't different? compare. Red grew a lot of the Nama Man, the Hustlers, uh, the Call Girls. Mm -hmm. Um, boosters. Right. And boosters. Well, well, I don't know what that is. What is a booster? Well, if you need an outfit, uh, find out where the boosters is and they'll go get it for you. So they're like shoplifters in basically. Right, right. They like, get clothes and stuff like that. Okay. And uh, they were just, they loved Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, they loved Grant and they were, I liked it because they were big money spenders. Exactly. Right. This bar was like start here and went around those two pulses there. And they might run a round of drinks from that post. And when it gets here, mm -hmm. whoever's on this ain't gonna run them back. So we'd be in Kansas City and I said, Grant, we ain't gonna get no paid, we, we, we're not getting paid down here. And he says, well, you just have to wait for your money, that's all. So I catch a flight and come on home. He came <laughs> yeah. back home, you know. Then uh, then be a record date or something. I miss I missed like three, four records, record dates. Because we just fall out. You fall out? Fall out, yeah. uh -huh. I just go out and say, ah. mm -hmm. and I missed the date. They be wanting me. He'd say, man, dang, I sure wish you was on the record, you know. But, you know, that's one of those things. Then we get back together. He said, but I want you back. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I go back, so. I think it was Christmas, about 1975. I think everybody everybody during that time wanted mini bikes. And I told my dad that I wanted a mini bike. And he's like, yeah, well, I don't think I'm going to get it for you. And I'm like, cool. Well, I remember Christmas, I, I woke up Christmas, and I look, I was looking around the house for my present, and there was nothing up under the tree. And I, was, I freaked out. So I went to the back room, and I seen a black mini bike. It was about this year, March, 75, I think, when I first took my bike out. It was snow out here on the ground. And it was like the biggest dream of my life to have my first mini bike. I remember my dad was trying to ride that bike like in May. And it was a funny sight to see him going down the street on his mini bike. And he was just wobbling and it almost fell off. And my brothers and I we were just sitting here laughing at him. You know? And he used to always just sit right in this spot over there. And we used to sit and talk about things. And he used to just watch the kids come over and play basketball. I am originally from Syracuse, New York. I was born in Syracuse, New York. And I, my family moved to New York City and I started studying dance and modern ballet and various types of dance. And the same was the school, dance school of Harlem. Well, one of the students came down, he saw me. I had a pretty nice body, you know, oh, all the things is. going. And uh, he started calling me body. He says, I think I'll put Lottie with it. And that's how I got. <laughs> I met Grant in San Francisco at the Champagne Supper Club. There was a club that uh, all the artists would come to and eat in the mornings. We did uh, three shows, okay? And our first show was at 2 a.m. in the morning, and we go to six. And Grant, yes, and uh, all of the performers and movie stars would come in there, and they would eat and see a production show. It was very exciting. You go to the counter and pick out your live lobster, your big steaks, and they do it in the back and bring it out to the table. And what year was this roughly? Okay, shall I tell you? Oh, come on. I promise I won't tell nobody. It'll oh, be all oh God, if you pay me, no, I'll tell you. Oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, roughly. Okay, this was in 1959. And he was, I, I, I can't remember who he was with, but I was introduced to him. Mm -hmm. And periodically I saw him in L.A., San Francisco, and then back in Michigan. And uh, only when we got in Michigan that we became friends, right. and, somewhat friends. And what did you mean about in Michigan? Was it any, well, any I was appearing at the 20 Grand. He was appearing at Watson, Mozambique. Oh, okay. What do you do in these clubs, basically? I mean, what's your role in these clubs? Well, I was a dancer. 
We're on Stratus. What, what do you mean you're a damn sir? I don't understand that. I mean, can I understand? I'm, I'm, I'm a little younger than you are, so when you say damn sir... Well, I, I don't think that you're too young to know about dancers, professional dancers. So, okay, so now you're in a jazz club, and they're playing jazz, so between sets, you, you dance no, no. between sets? If I many times was booked on the show as a co-star, uh-huh. I've always been a co-star. See? No, I yeah. love it. Okay. Uh, co-stars, I co-starred, okay, we're going back to Detroit mm -hmm. with, at the 20 Grand with the Motown. I was with Motown as a co-star with Marvin Gaye, mm -hmm. Four Tops, Spinners, Aretha Franklin, name them. I've co-starred with them. And uh, the show would open up with the band. They never have an MC, vocal, dancer, mm -hmm. and the main act. Featured attraction. So, example, if my dad was was playing here tonight, what would be the format? The format would be that uh, they would open up with the band. Right. They bring on a vocal. Mm -hmm. Then they would bring on the dancer, exotic dancer. Right. And then they would bring on the great great grand green, and he would do X amount of tunes. Yeah. yeah. Or he would be have his own band that he's playing with. It. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. You know, someone told me that you and my dad was kind of intimate. Or, no. Is that true? No. You know, someone told me that. We were just that good and, friends. And I'm quite sure that if that was true, you, you would tell me, wouldn't you? you wouldn't, I don't wouldn't. know if I wouldn't have if you paid me. <laughs> See? That's really <laughs> No, but seriously, we, uh, many people thought we were because we had such a great relationship. I still think that you could, you could be my stepmom, but I don't know about it yet. But anyway. <laughs> I, I had a 